Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Teaching Statistical Concepts of Sampling Variability and Sampling Distribution Using our Guru. My name is Danny Shapiro, and I'm on the marketing team here at Hawks Learning. Our speaker today is Dr. Maury Jamshidian. Dr. Jamshidian is a CNSM Distinguished Professor in the Mathematics Department at California State University, Fullerton. He serves as the Graduate Advisor for the Masters of Science in Statistics. His past positions include Associate Professor of Statistics at the University of Central Florida and Senior Statistician at the BMDP Statistical Software. His area of research is broadly in computational st statistics with publications in major theoretical and applied journals such as the Journal of American Statistical Association, Journal of the Royal Statistical Society, and Psychometrica. He is currently an associate editor for the Journal of Computational and Graphical Statistics and, is in, and in the past has served as associate editor for the American Statistician, Journal of Statistical Software, and Journal of Statistical Computation and Simulation. His current activities include research in statistics education and development of statistical software for teaching statistics. All right, so you, as you can see, this software is um, divided into different parts, data, plots, analytics, and probability and simulation. And I will be using uh, pretty much um, everything, um, all of these sections in my, uh, uh, in my uh, talk today. So let me begin uh, with a plot here. And I have already created a plot uh, in, um, for this webinar. And this is a pie chart of uh, the distribution of ethnicity of undergraduate students at Harvard University. Um, the idea here is uh, that I will present uh, simulating from this population, that is the, the population of undergraduate, Harvard, uh, undergraduate students at Harvard University. Um, and um, we, would, we are interested in, for example, estimating the proportion of white students or Asian students, et cetera. So you can see that uh, there are 44% white um, in, at Harvard, 17% Asian, 12% um, international, et cetera. And um, so the way I would start this, first of all, by the way, I would usually use um, my own university uh, ethnicity data, but I just chose Harvard here because it's a famous university um, that everybody knows about. Um, so uh, the way I would start this is I would ask my students, suppose that I take a sample of size 100 from this population. And um, you know, how many white students do you expect in that sample? And you know, they would see the 44% here. And um, well, I think they would come up with 44 in a sample of size 100. And then I say, okay, what about a sample of size 25? That's a little bit harder, but 25 is one fourth of 100 and maybe they can come up with um, 11. And oh, what, what about a sample of size 1,000? How many white students? And maybe 440. And then, with that introduction, uh, you know, then I uh, explained that we can actually simulate sampling from this um, population by computer. And um, so after that explanation, I go on um, to, um, to do actual simulations. So to do the simulations here, I'm going to show you a data set that I have already prepared here. And this data set is essentially the ethnicities, white, Asian, international, Hispanic, African American, and unknown. And these are the percentages that you saw uh, on the pie chart. All right, so uh, what I'm going to do is I am going to go to probability and simulation section. Uh, so let me just go to the probability and simulation section here and open random selection. So what this random selection does is it randomly selects from a given data set. So in particular, I want to random, take a random selection from this particular data set. So if I just open this, you can see that I can give it a sample size. I will explain the rest of these. One thing that is um, uh, important is that it is, you can sample with or without replacement. Obviously here, I want to sample with replacement from uh, my data set. So I'm going to just select sample with replacement. 
And let's say that I take a sample of size 100 and intentionally I'm going to do something wrong at the beginning. In other words, my samples are not going to be representative. So let, let's just do this. Um, and just as a, um, so I need to select the data, data set. So I'm going to just go ahead and select my data set. In fact, just so that I don't see this clutter, clutter of data set, what I prefer to do is just go ahead and uh, filter Harvard um, ethnicity here and then come back. And um, so I don't see all of my data sets all the time here. So I can just do that. So if you filter, you can just see only the data set that you're working with. So I'm going to just go ahead and select Harvard, and I'm going to take a sample of size 100 here. And um, so um, let I would say go, and I will explain to students, OK, so uh, the first person that I observed was an Asian. The second person was Asian. Uh, you know, the third person was Hispanic. And in fact, these are just the percentages that were in the data set. Let's just get rid of them and just say, let's just sample from first column only. Uh, because uh, when, it, when you sample, it samples both columns. So let me just do first column only. So I just only get the ethnicity values. All right. So now um, the question is, well, we have discussed that, for example, we expect about 44 students in white, right? Well, let's see how many white we got. What I can do here is I can right click here and I say group by ethnicity. And in particular, let's look at white, number of white students. Well, we got seven students, and that's very strange, right? Okay. Um, well, what about Asians? Well, we got 23. Uh, well, we expected, remember, about 17%. So 17, well, maybe it's not that bad. Uh, but certainly the white doesn't seem to be, the number of whites in our sample doesn't seem to be right. Um, then I would do, then what I would do next is I would say, okay, maybe, you know, is it impossible to get seven uh, whites in a sample of size 100? It's not impossible, but it's improbable. And then here is where I um, explain the idea of seed here. All right. And uh, so I say, all right, let's just change um, uh, the seed to something like 115. And redo the sampling. So I explain to them that when I change the seed, it's like I'm starting over um, uh, by taking a sample. All right. So now, well, since African American is showing already, uh, there are 13, Af 13 uh, uh, students in my African American um, a sample. Well, for African American, I expected around seven. Maybe it's not too bad. What about the whites? Um, so it is, um, for the whites, there are, it goes from 13, uh, 14 to 30, that's around 17. And what about Asians? Let's see that. That uh, goes from 49 to 31, that's about 18. So I'm getting about 13, 17, 18. And so now here is what I explain um, to students that what is wrong here, and I, I generally ask them, what do you think is wrong? And um, so the idea of what is wrong here is that if you look at this data, what we have been doing is taking actually a sample of ethnicity with equal probability for white, Asian, international, Hispanic, African-American, and unknown, whereas we actually want percentages to follow this percentage column. In other words, we want our sample to have 44% white, 17% Asian, et cetera. So how do we do that? Well, we go back and let me just start just a new uh, random selection here and just do it in a new tab. So let me just don't save and close this one. Uh, so let me just again um, select my um, data here uh, and uh, let's do sample size 100. And now here is what I'm going to do. I'm going to say do do the sampling with um, uh, you know, percentages um, as uh, the proportions for each um, ethnicity group. Um, all right, so, and then let's just choose one call, first column as well. And let's see how we do now this time. Well, so let's again um, group by ethnicity here. So how many whites did we get? Wow, now this time looks good. We got about 40 whites, you know, we expect about 44 whites, right? And, um, then, um, you know, let's see, what about um, Asians? You know, I have uh, 62 uh, to 41. That's about 22 Asians, which is not too bad. I expected about 17. 
What about African Americans? Around five, and I expected around seven. Now it looks like the sample is um, is fine, and I should be um, uh, good. Now, what I want to do now is I want to look at the sampling variability in a with a little bit more uh, detail, and I want to zoom on it a little bit. All right, so again, let me um, just go ahead and open a new one, just um, a new random selection here. And I'm going to just take the Harvard ethnicity. All right, so in order to show this sampling variability, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this idea of replication, and I'm going to use the idea of replication. So let's say that I take a sample of size 10, I replicate three times, and of course, I want to choose my probability to be percentages and take a sample from column one. All right, uh, so here you can see that I have sample one. There are 10, um, 10 individuals in sample one. There are 10 individuals in sample two, and there are 10 individuals in sample three, right? And uh, for the moment, let's focus on proportion of white students. So if I look at, for example, sample one, how many white students do I have? I have one, two, three, um, four, and five here. And let's say in sample three, how many whites do I have? I have, um, let's see here, um, one, two, and three here, right? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask um, uh, our guru to actually compute sample proportions for each of these. All right, now I explained to students that, that the sample proportion is a statistic, therefore I'm going to ask our guru to compute a statistic. And here what you can do is you can actually use R code to write um, different um, statistics that you are interested in, and I'm going to just write a statistic of computing sample proportion for each of the samples. So as I said, I'm going to focus on white students. And actually, to get the proportion of whites, I could simply say mean of ethnicity equal equal white, and I will get what I want. But this might be a little bit hard for students to understand um, how this results in a uh, proportion of uh, white students. So I'm going to take it step at a time. And I'm going to say, well, let's first of all determine the sample size. The sample size I can determine and length of, I notice the variable names are here and I'm going to click on them so that I don't mis misspell them. So length of ethnicity, because each sample there are, you know, for example, it is a vector really. And so N equals length, length of ethnicity in this case is 10. So it's going to give me the sample size. So I'm writing a little bit of an R code here. Um, for your classes, you might have this prepared ahead of time or um, you know, I'm not sure how important it is for you to explain necessarily the code. I do spend a little bit of time explaining the code to them. Then I want to compute the number of whites. And I would say this is equal to the sum of um, uh, ethnicity uh, equal equals white. And again, I explained this. What happens is ethnicity equal equals white. When it looks at, when you look at this, these data, whenever it sees a white, you're going to ethnicity equal equal white becomes equal to one. Whenever it's not a white, it becomes a zero. So you have like one, one, zero, one, etc. And then when you add all of those, you get the number of whites. And of course, the final thing that I want is um, the number of whites um, uh, divided by n, which gives me the sample proportion. So let's do that. Uh, divided by n here. Okay. And uh, let's go with that. All right. So you can see that, you know, I got 50% white in the first sample, 50% white in the second sample, and 30% white um, in the third sample. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is just to, to see this, the, the variability a little bit better, I'm going to change my replication to 100. So I'm going to replicate 100. So these are representing now 100 samples of size, the proportions sample proportions for 100 um, samples of size 100. And let's save this as, um, let's call it uh, prop, uh, prop N10. 
And let me just also do that. Let me just explain also to you what's the difference here. So when I do this save as here, I do get actually um, everything that I have done here um, will be saved right here. And in fact, I'm gonna share it with you at the end of the seminar through RGR files. Um, so all of the parameters of the dialog box are saved. If I want to use the data set, I will save it as data set. And then you see that the data set is saved and you're gonna see it right here that it appeared in data uh, sets. Okay, all right, so let's take a look at a dot plot of this. It's always good to, to use graphs to um, show uh, you know, uh, values. So I'm gonna just go ahead and use this prop n10 and I'm gonna select white, which was the name, name, the name of the variable. And I'm gonna just go ahead and produce the dot plot. All right. So, um, you know, I explained to each student that, um, uh, you know, each of the dots represents a sample of size 10 and an estimate for the proportion of 44% that we are after, right? Of course, in reality, 44% wouldn't be known to us. And it's interesting that you could get a, an estimate as low as 0% and an estimate as high as 80%. The fortunate thing is that most of these um, values are, you know, between, uh, let's say 0.3 to 0.5, right? Um, all right, so, uh, so that is good. There is one more idea. So let, let me just go ahead and um, save this as well. Plot, plot, and 10, let's call it. So we have it for later reference, okay. Um, now, uh, let's um, go ahead and look at one more idea here. If I just go to the data and I right click on this data set and I ask for, give me summary data. This gives me the mean of those 100 um, uh, data points that I have. And notice that the mean is about 42%, which is very close to 44% that was we are looking at. And here is, you can, here is where you can actually introduce the idea of unbiasedness, right? So even though each sample might be, might be quite far from the truth, but on average you would get a value that is close to the true population. And so the idea of unbiasedness can be also explained to students um, uh, through looking at the mean of these uh, values. All right, so with that, now let's just go ahead and see what happens if um, we take a large sample. So I'm just gonna go ahead and modify this, what I have here. And instead of sample of size 10, let's just take a sample of size 100. Okay, so let's do that. All right, so these are based on sample of size 100. And right away, you can see that the values are pretty much closer to 0.44 that we want. And let's save these as, um, save as N100 and save this one as N100. Okay, and let's also take a look at the dot plot um, for, for these. All right, so I'm gonna just go ahead and select N100 and I'm gonna go white here. And now you can see that actually the values are much closer to that 0.44. In fact, you got a whole bunch of values, um, uh, well, at least six values at 0.44 itself. But interestingly, even with a size um, 100, you still get a data point that is way out there, or at least it is pretty far um, uh, from 0.44, which is 0.65, I guess, in this case, right? All right, um, or, or maybe around 0.7. All right, uh, so uh, let's go ahead and go to the summary statistic again for this and take a look at the summary statistic. And the mean here again is right on the money. It's 0.44 and again, the idea of unbiasedness. So the idea is that the bias regardless of the sample size uh, the sample proportion is an unbiased estimator of the population proportion. All right. Okay. So that is um, a little bit about showing students different sampling variability. Let me just save these things 
here and 100. I want to save these. So what I do is actually I save everything that I do during my lectures and I will say I will share them through RGR file with students. And that's what I'm going to do after the webinar. I will share these um, with whoever is watching the webinar or, or whoever is going to go to the link to get the, the uh, information. OK. So now let's change gears here. Let me, I don't think I need this one. Um, let's change gears and um, look at sampling distributions. In order to look at the sampling distributions, I will need to do more replications, okay? So let's go back to probability simulation and random selection here. Uh, I'm gonna select my Harvard ethnicity. And um, let me just take a sample of size 10 here, okay? And um, now I'm going to replicate 10,000 times. So I would be able to see the distribution better. And of course, I want the probability here, the percentages, and I want to sample column one. And I want to come up with this statistic here, right, which is the proportion of whites here. Let me just say white. And this time I'm going to do the shortcut. I'm going to just simply say mean. Rather than writing three lines of code, I could just say mean of. Um, ethnicity equal equals white. And I want to add one more statistic, and that would be about African Americans. So let's just go ahead and say mean of ethnicity equal equal African. American. I think I have a misspell here. All right. Uh, so just uh, just before I um, go and do this, I want to point out that the reason that I have chosen African American is because it has a small percentage, and um, you know the white has a percentage that is close to forty four percent, and as you will see. Um, this, will, this is going to make a difference when we, when we are talking about some central limit theorem. Uh, so uh, let's go ahead and uh, go with this. Um, and by the way, these things that are in the code, you have to make sure that the students actually write exactly what is um, in the variable so they don't uh, make a mistake there. So notice that, you know, when I run this, you know, this goes within a few seconds, you, got, you have essentially, um, you know, generated a sample of size 10 for each sample you have computed the proportion and you have done this 10,000 times. So I have 10,000 values here. All right, so let me just uh, save this and call it, let's say prop uh, n10, uh, let's say rep 10k or something like that. Okay. So I'm gonna save the data set and I'm going to save the parameters here. All right. Um, then let me also, so I want to look at large samples versus small samples. So let me also do uh, a sample of size 100 here. So I'm going to change this to a sample of size 100. And you can see that within a few seconds, this thing is done. So it's, uh, the programs are quite efficient and they, they run very fast. So let me just change this to an 100. Uh, and save it and change this one to N100 and save this as well. Okay. All right, with that, let's just take a look. What I want to do is I want to uh, compare the samples of size 100 and samples of size 10. So I have this, these data for samples of size 10. I have these data for samples of size 100. I would want to put these two data sets together and show a graph of them. So right now, these are two separate data sets. And I, what I want to do is I want to merge these two data sets. In general, I think it's important for students to understand merging data sets and what merging means. So I want to put these things side by side. And usually in my classes, when I teach exploratory data analysis, I teach them these types of concepts of manipulating data, like merging and appending and all of that. But in order to merge these data, what I need to have is a common variable based on which I merge the data. And hopefully at that time, my students usually know what I mean by that. So in order to do that, I'm going to go to the transform function and, um, and actually create a um, merging variable. 
So I'm going to go ahead and pick uh, prop n10 here. And I'm going to add a variable. So in the transform, you can add variables. You can manipulate variables, etc. So I'm going to add a variable. I'm going to call it cases. And in here, you can write R code. There are 10,000 cases here. So I'm going to say C1 colon 10,000. This is a little R code, uh, R code which says create a vector from 1 to 10,000. All right. And I will just add that. So if I just go right here, you can see that I have um, cases added to this, to my data set. Uh, it doesn't matter what I call it. Let's just call it transform one. That's fine. Let's just save it as that. And by the way, here also, since the save parameter is on, also it will save everything that I have done in case I need to come back and change it. And let's also do the same thing with um, a sample of size, our, our, our samples of size 100. So let's call that also cases. And I'm going to just add that column C1 to 10,000. OK, so I added the cases again. By the way, the case number that you see here, this is, these are just used, uh, uh, these are just generated by our guru, and it's just the case number internal to our group. But this, this is the way, variable that I have uh, created. So let me call this transform two here. All right, and now I'm ready to take transform one and transform two and merge them. So I'm going to go to the, my merge function here and um, merge the two data sets. So I'm going to take um, transform one, I'm going to take transform two, and I'm going to add a merging variable, which is cases. So what this is doing is essentially, um, you see you have case one, so you can see there's white X, African American X. So this is case one in the first data set, which was based on a sample of size 10. White Y, American Y, this is the white and African American, sorry, African American um, for case one from the second data set. So essentially case one from first data set, case one from second data set, case two from the first data set, case two from the second data set. So these are all uh, together now. And I need to save this um, uh, here. And let's save it as, maybe we can call it all prop or something like that. All right. So what I want to do now is I want to go to the dot plot and see how the distribution of these um, compare. So let's just go to um, plots here. And I'm going to go to dot plot. OK. And I'm going to select all prop. And I'm, I'm going to see all of those. Let's first look at um, the larger sample size here. Oh, sorry, I, I do want to, I'm, I'm comparing to uh, Af African American to white. That's not what I want to do. Let me just um, go back and search, search here. Sorry, uh, I wanted to look at these two. Yes. Okay, um, so uh, first of all, um, remember we are estimating, um, you know, the a population value of 44%. It's nice to just go ahead and actually put that 44% line there. So I can actually superimpose a line right there so we can see where, where our target is. So here you can write 0 0.044. It doesn't matter what you put for Y because you want to have a, a vertical line here. So I'm gonna just put one and two here. And let me just make the line width a little bit bigger. And let me just make, uh, let's say a, a red line here. Uh, sorry, let me just do this. And go. Okay, so you can see that actually the distribution is first of all centered at the true population value. You can see that this distribution looks pretty normal. So you can talk about the central limit theorem. Also, um, you know, this is so the top one is based on a sample of size 10, the bottom one is based on a sample of size 100, right? And so you can discuss the idea that even with a sample of size 10, you kind of are seeing this normality on the top part, right? 
the difference is the variances that are quite different here, right? Because these values are very much concentrated about the center, whereas you get um, with the samples of size 10, you could get uh, estimates as low as 0% all the way to values that are higher than 80%, okay? So what about looking at the African-American distribution now? So let's do that. All right. So of course, now I want to change my line to uh, 0.07 because my target was uh, 0.07 here. So let me just do that. Okay, yeah. So um, interestingly, again, look at the top. This is based on a sample of size 100, right? And you can see it is certainly centered at 0 0.07, okay? And uh, so, and it's normally distributed. But this sample of size 10 does not have a normal distribution. So here is where you can talk about the idea of how large should N be for the central limit theorem to take effect, right? And so remember, the, the population proportion is 0 0.07 here. In the previous case, the population proportion was 0 0.44, right? So these ideas that we talk about rules of thumb, like n times p has to be bigger than 5, can be communicated through here, right? Because the sample size, let's say, is 100. 100 times 0 0.07 is 7. It's bigger than 7. That would be the previous case, right, which I showed you. And here, you know, if I look at 10 times 0 0.07, it's just 0 0.7, right, for this guy. And so that's why you can see that, um, you know, the, norm the normality of uh, the central limit theorem is not taking effect. That is, how large should, should N be depends on the population distribution. And to, to put it in technical terms, right, um, for the African Americans, the, the population distribution is a Bernoulli 0 0.07, versus for the white um, uh, students uh, population, it is Bernoulli 0.44. So with that, um, let me just quickly go to uh, my PowerPoints now here, if I, if I can. And so, uh, so I talked about um, uh, sample variation, um, and what was interesting that even random samples can produce outliers for you. We talked about unbiasedness regardless of the sample size. Uh, in some ways, we have shown law of large numbers. That is, uh, the larger the sample, the closer to the, pop, uh, to the population value you get, your, your estimates will be. Um, you can uh, have different exercises for law of large numbers using our group, uh, but you have shown that. And then, of course, you have talked about the central limit theorem and um, you know, how uh, the distributions are normal and, more importantly, how um, the normality depends on n and n, how large should n be depends on the uh, population distribution. All right, uh, so with that now, I want to get into uh, some inference. Um, so I want to talk about coming up with a confidence interval for proportions, for example. Um, so I'm going to go through an example. Say that I want to obtain an interval estimate for a proportion of Hispanic students at my school, and suppose that I have taken a sample of size 100 and obtained a sample proportion of 0.35. Now, by this time, students know that, uh, you know, there, this 0.35 is not set in the stone, right? And there are variabilities, right? And hopefully they can appreciate the idea of having an interval estimate. All right, with that then, the question is, how do I come up with an interval estimate? Of course, classically, we would have, you know, our formula for the confidence interval. Um, and in that formula, for example, if you notice, you actually take 0.35 as the population um, value. And this is the same thing, the same, I'm gonna use the same idea here, and, I, and I'm gonna take this as my population value, and I'm gonna, uh, you know, determine the variability. What kind of variability is there in this sample? So uh, let's go to our guru again. I have actually prepared a, um, a data set uh, for this. Uh, let me see here. If not, I can, uh, let me just um, go ahead and uh, my school, I think I've called it. 
All right, so let me just also close some of these ideas here. All right, and let me just go here and save this also. Um, let's say dot plot and then all. Okay. All right, so here's the, uh, the data set that I, um, uh, sorry, let me see here. This is not the right data set that I want. Sorry, let me just go ahead and create it quickly. All right, let me just go ahead and do two rows here. Um, let me sorry, let me have it. Let me just close this one up. Hold on. Sorry. I want to create a data frame. I'm going to do this. Um, all right. So variable one, I'm going to call it ethnicity. And variable two, I'm going to call it percentages. And then I'm going to have ethnicity is, let's say, Hispanic and non-Hispanic. And then I'm going to have 0.65, uh, sorry, 0.35. That was the proportion that I had observed and 0.65 here. Okay, and let's save that here. Um, so let's say, um, let's call this Hispanic. All right. Okay, now I can go to um, my um, probability simulation and do the same thing again. I'm gonna do a random selection and I'm gonna take from Hispanic, let's say a sample of size 100 because that 0.35 was based on a sample of size 100. I'm gonna replicate 10,000 times. Okay, and with the probabilities given with those percentages, all right. And um, I might as well say here, and the, the statistic that I want to compute is, um, let me just add the statistic, which is Hispanic. And I'm going to just say uh, mean of ethnicity equal equal. All right. So now um, with that, I'm gonna get, you know, the variations if I were to take different samples of size 10. So let's just also say these as Hispanic here. Uh, let's say Hispanic um, one, because it, I already have a data set called Hispanic. So let me say Hispanic one. Okay. All right. Now let's go to, um, our plot again, I'm going to use the dot plot. And I'm going to just go to Hispanic one and look at the variation. Right. Now, first of all, my observed value, let's go ahead and superimpose the observed value by adding a line here. So my observed value was 0.35. Right. So as I said, the y value doesn't matter. So I'm going to just go ahead and make this red um, three. And let's just go ahead and add that. Okay, you see, the, the observed value is right in the middle. And this is going to happen all the time. But then I want, you can see the variation. If I were to take a different sample of size, then you know, this is showing me that I might get a different value, right? And so if I want a 95% confidence interval, essentially there are 10,000 values here and I want to see where the middle line, what is the range for the middle line of 5%, which means that essentially I have to get rid of 500 from the tails, that means 250 from the first tail and, uh, you know, from the lower tail and, and 250 from the upper tail. And so I want to find out what is the 250th point here and what is the value of the 970. 9,750th point on the right tail. In order to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the data and I'm going to use my sort function. Okay. So uh, let's do this, uh, bring the variable Hispanic and sorry, the data set Hispanic and our variable Hispanic and sort it. Now I have sorted my values and it says, you know, for example, the lowest percentage uh, was 0.19, etc. I want to look at my 250th value. 
Okay. And the 250th value is 0.26. So that would be the lower limit of the confidence interval. And if I look at the uh, 9,750th value, that would be 0.44. So this suggests a confidence interval from 0.26 to 0.44, right? Now, if, if you go ahead and actually look at the usual computations that we do uh, for confidence intervals, um, you can see that this is based on the usual formula that uh, we use um, in our classic ways of teaching. So it's uh, point, you know, you get 0 0.26 to 0 0.44, so you exact, pretty much got the same confidence interval. The difference being that, you know, when you're introducing only formulas that the students just see some, uh, you know, procedural ways of do computing confidence intervals, whereas when you are doing it by simulation, at least they can see um, the variability here. So as a last piece, um, I want to also um, talk about test of hypothesis. And so I'm going to go ahead and do the following. Suppose that we observe a sample, of, a sample proportion of 35% like we did in our sample, based on a sample of size 100. The question is, is this sufficient evidence to conclude that the proportion of Hispanics is more than 30%? So I'm testing the null hypothesis p equal to 0.3 versus the alternative hypothesis p bigger than 0.3. And uh, so, uh, you know, hopefully we have explained to students at, at this point that, you know, when we are testing a hypothesis, we assume that the null hypothesis is true. So we have to really see what kind of sample proportion we can observe if in fact the population proportion is 30%. So with that, let's just go ahead and um, uh, do a simulation for that, right? So let me uh, just go ahead and get rid of this now. And maybe I can uh, save this. Okay. All right. So uh, let me close this editor. All right. So I'm going to do this a little bit differently just to show you. We could do the same exact thing by generating, by actually uh, constructing a data set with 30% and 70% Hispanic and non Hispanic, but I'm going to do this a little bit differently to show you another feature of our guru. In, instead, here, I'm going to just use my random generator and I'm going to uh, use the Bernoulli distribution um, because essentially I'm saying that, you know, what I'm getting is either Hispanic or not, Span not Hispanic. And the probability of success is what is in the um, null hypothesis, which is 0 0.30. The sample size that I had used was 100. And again, I'm gonna replicate 10,000 times, okay? Here again, you can write your own custom statistics, for example, to come up with the sample proportion, but then there are some statistics ready here as well. And as I explained, if I just take the mean of the Bernoulli's, I'm going to get the sample proportions. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do. I took the mean and I get now the variations based on uh, population proportion being 30%. Okay, let's take a look at the graphical display of this data, these data. Um, all right, so let's call it test hype. So that's what test of hypothesis. Um, save both this and this. All right, and let's go to our dot plot again. Sorry. Okay, so this is the data set that I want to look at, and these are the proportions, and let's take a look. All right, so let me first put the 0.3 uh, line um, and also the line that is our observed value. Okay, so let me go to details here and superimpose the line. Okay, so 0 0.3, uh, 0 0.3, 2, uh, let's make it 3 here, and let's make the color red maybe in the middle, and let's add one more line here. And this is going to be 0.35. This is our observed line. Uh, one, 0.35, two, and then let's say 
three. And then I'm gonna go with a green line, let's say on this one. And now we are gonna run. Okay, so first of all, the distribution that I have is centered at the population value that comes from the null hypothesis. And this is my observed value. And here, for example, to compute the p-value, I need to get the proportion of the, of the points that are at or right to the 0.35 line. So all of, I need to find out how many data, data points I have here. Remember, there are 10,000 data points, and you need to remind your students of um, that. So let me also call this dot plot test of hypothesis or test. Okay, in order to do that, I'm gonna do, again, you could use, for example, the sort to, for me to show you a diff, yet different, fun, a different function. I'm gonna go to subset here. And I'm gonna look at test of hypothesis. And I'm gonna add a logical expression here. And I'm gonna say, look at those proportions that are greater than or equal to my observed value, which was 0.35, okay? So when I do that, I see that I have 1,674 of them. And that gives me 1,674 divided by 10,000. That gives me a p-value of 0.1674, which um, means I would not reject the null hypothesis. So this was an example of doing a test of hypothesis. As a last point, I want to show you also that you could actually do this in, for example, proportion inference. I have already made this um, uh, just to save time. So for example, you go here, you have the factor is ethnicity. Um, here, I guess I have it as a wrong, um, I had Hispanic here, I should have. 35%, um, uh, this was the sample size, you observed 35. You could do a, a large sample Z test of hypothesis or, or a large sample, uh, sorry, confidence interval or test of hypothesis. And if you run this, you get your output and you can see that I got the confidence interval 0.26 to 0.4 uh, to um, yeah 0.44 here, and then here is the p-value. In this case, is 0.14. I had come up with 0.16. Of course, these are different methods, and they could lead into different um, results. All right, so that uh, pretty much um, ends uh, my demo. Uh, let me just uh, talk about tra training pre pricing and purchasing of our guru. Um, we have one one-on-one -on -one training available for uh, faculty members. Um, also, if you have a group of, uh, you know, your colleagues that, uh, that want to see uh, features of our guru, we have uh, training workshops for them. Um, the pricing, all instructors can get um, immediate and complimentary access for free. Um, and, um, Students' um, licenses are $20, $20 sorry, for 12 months uh, subscription. And to purchase our guru from Hawks, uh, this is the information. You could uh, have your bookstores and the follow, the, use the, the following ISBN, the, the ISBN shown on the um, screen here, um, or you could uh, use um, uh, our guru's website directly uh, by going into the register section and um, registering for an account. Faculty, of course, can go to our guru um, website directly and get, get their free account at any time. So with that, I'll just turn it to Danny and if there are any questions. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Jamshidian. I will remind our audience that you can go ahead and ask questions in that question and answer box. You'll find that at the top or bottom of your screen. Um, there is also a chat window if you can't find the Q&A box that you can enter your questions in there. So we let me pull that up. We'll give the audience a minute here to start asking. And here's one. Um, have you used the statistical applets that can be used for teaching sampling distribution? And how would you compare them with the methods that you just presented? Um, yes, I have seen those and, and they are useful. Um, I guess the difference here is that when you actually um, have students go through the steps or the students actually see each of these steps, um, they can actually realize what is involved and how things are being 
generated. In applets, you usually have certain parameters that you know you move around and you just see different pictures, whereas here you go step by step and see the whole process from the sampling, right, um, to computing a proportion and then uh, to looking at the distributions of uh, what you got. So this is a lot more instructive and especially, you know, I follow these with um, uh, projects that they do and hopefully this helps uh, their understanding of sampling variability and sampling distribution. Okay, thank you. And another question, why do you use data plots for all of your graphs? Uh, so uh, I guess you meant dot plot probably is what I've been using. And um, so th the reason that I use dot plots is because um, essentially each data, each, each of the samples that I take is represented by a dot. And uh, so that is kind of interesting, especially when I take like, uh, you know, when I do replications of 100. Maybe for the cases where you have like 10,000 replication, you can use a histogram and that works um, as well. Uh, so uh, it's just that I did, I just stuck to dot plot for this, but I think for a smaller number of applications like 100, a dot plot is pretty uh, useful and instructive to use. Uh, yes, that is exactly what the question asked. I'm sorry, I'm having uh, trouble with my words today. Um, we, <laughs> have, we have another question. Um, what is the feedback from students regarding the ease of use and how steep is the learning curve? All right, so um, are you, I'm assuming that you are referring to, um, to our group. In general, obviously for any program, there is a, a you know, uh, there is some learning curve. Um, um, usually, uh, you know, within a week, I think students are, get pretty familiar with uploading data or graphing and things like that. And uh, we have found uh, it to be pretty easy to use. In terms of this, if you're specifically talking about sampling distribution, let me say that I have been really going through this very fast because I'm talking to an audience of instructors um, which are familiar with these concepts and I'm simply trying to uh, you know, introduce tools to you guys. Um, so when I go with my students, this goes a lot slower and you know, we, we do a lot of hands-on, a lot of uh, projects. And the learning curve I have found in terms of just using our guru is not at all very steep. Um, and you know, within a week, I think in the lab, um, uh, we can, um, you know, students get pretty familiar and it becomes easy. Notice that uh, you know, there are a lot of help available. There are videos in every dialog box uh, that they can watch and there are also uh, question marks on every section of a dialog box that they can open and read and get help. Thank you. And we have another question here um, regarding students. How do you share what you do with students? Yeah, so um, actually, you know, uh, for example, if I'm showing these types of concepts of simulation and stuff like that, it's difficult for students to take notes. So what I do is, Essentially, I will save, um, you know, uh, as, as you saw, I was saving everything that I was doing. And uh, there's a mechanism in um, our guru uh, where we, we can bundle everything into what, our, what, we, what we call RGR files. And I put those RGR files in our uh, learning management systems, you know, whether you have Canvas or Moodle or whatever it is. And then they can go ahead and import those into their um, account. And um, so essentially I share those RGR files and they can see exactly what I have done. And in fact, when I um, you know, give them projects, they sort of start off with those RGR files and modify them as they go on. So that is how I share it. And I don't know if I'm correct or not, uh, Danny, you, you are gonna be sharing the RGR files for this. I can give you some of those. Yes, absolutely. We would love to share the RGR files along with the recording that we will uh, email out to everyone who registered for the webinar today. Okay, great. Okay, one final question. We are getting to the end of our time, but I wanna make sure that we squeeze this in. Um, can you talk about uh, how you assess your students? Yeah, so assessment, um, you know, first of all, um, fortunately my classes are in a lab and I give my exams in a lab, so I can actually ask them to run some stuff in the lab. 
but if you don't have lab, essentially it amounts to, you know, exporting and copying and pasting from our guru output into your exams and then ask questions about them. So for example, you know, you might want to just look at two different distributions and ask them which one do you think has a smaller n or things of that nature. Um, so, uh, but if you have a lab, certainly you can, um, like a project, just give them some RGR files, in fact, so that because there's not a lot of time during the exam, I give them RG RGR files that they, imp that they uh, import into our group and they just modify it and um, uh, in order to uh, give solutions to the exam. So that's how I do it. Okay, well, Dr. Jamshadian, uh, thank you again so much for this presentation. Um, thank you to our audience for being here with us today as we approach the holidays. If you do have any questions, please direct them to us at marketing at hawkslearning.com and we will work to get back to you with an answer. Uh, we, like I said, we will be emailing you a link to view this webinar along with the files from the presentation today, so be on the lookout for those, uh, and I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. All right. Thank you, uh, Danny, and happy holidays to everybody.